Honorable Member from St. Albert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, during the last session of the legislature, I was able to stand and deliver my maiden speech. And those 15 minutes were easily filled because St. Albert is a remarkable community. I won't tell you it's the most beautiful, but it is. <laughs> Thank you. St. <laughs> Albert is remarkable in a lot of ways. It's remarkable for its history. It's one of the oldest communities in Alberta for its growth and for its people. There are a lot of famous people that come from St. Albert. Lois Hole, Joe McGinla, Mark Messier, to name a few. St. Albert has been recognized nationally, nationally as one of the best places to raise a family. I could go on and on, but I won't. That's not what I'm going to focus on today. Always the nerd, I used to watch Question Period on my computer while I was working. <laughs> And I can remember saying so many times, I wish I could get all of those people trapped in a room for about an hour so I could let them know what I think on certain issues. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to explain some of the issues about the sector that I worked in, the sector that I, that I worked in most of my adult life. So I'm going to give you a little history. Before being elected the MLA for St. Albert, I was the executive director of the Losica Foundation. I managed an organization in St. Albert that was one of the largest employers in that community. And we offered community supports for people with developmental disabilities. We offered residential supports, which mean we had uh, staff go into people's homes so they could live independently in the community, as independently as possible from living in their own apartment, their own condominium, having a roommate, having a couple of roommates. We also offered employment supports and day program supports. So all the way from um, supporting someone to do volunteer work in the community to helping someone find a job that they wanted and making sure that that job was uh, doable for them. The lens that I viewed St. Albert was always focused on the people of St. Albert with disabilities, their families, and their friends. So I'd like to share some of those things. And I'd like to tell you about some remarkable St. Albertans that you probably have never heard of, but um, were giants in my life. Brian Munchworth is, uh, he's no longer with us, but uh, his family, he grew up in St. Albert. He lived his whole life in St. Albert. His family was uh, instrumental in getting the Special Olympics started in St. Albert. He actually, it was his dream to have his own place, to live as independently as possible, and with staff support, he did do that. So for the last 15 years of his life, I believe, he had his own condominium, he participated in his community, and he volunteered. Sonny uh, Rochette was a young man, originally from Quebec, who um, also wanted to live as independently as possible, have a job, have a girlfriend, get married one day. That didn't turn out. Um, he died at a very young age. But we were able to be part of his life and to support him. Len Bambush, another fellow who's no longer here, um, spent the majority of his life in the Michener Center. He was taken there as an infant, grew up there, but in his 40s actually managed to transition to the community. We were lucky enough to get him. And so we were able to support him for about 15 years, I believe. And he was able to live out the, the end years of his life in the community with friends. He didn't have family anymore, but he had friends. He had a meaningful life. Uh, oh, sure. Joanne Lewis, another woman who was all of about four foot two, was the most powerful woman I've ever met. She uh, had Down syndrome. And uh, she always wanted to have her own life in the community, and she did. She lived her life that way. She lived her life exactly the way she wanted to. And lastly, Gordon Opleta, another man who we supported to live in the community, to have a job. He was, some, he was somebody that had the same job for 20 years. I don't think he ever had a sick day. I don't think he was ever late. And I don't think he ever had a mean word to say to anybody. These were giants in St. Albert. These were people who shaped my life. But what I wanted to say about them is that none of them ever suffered from a disability. 
None of them were defined by the disability that they did have. And they were only the most vulnerable when their power was given away by a label. They were always people first. So getting back to the point of having you locked in a room, I wanted to explain a little bit about this sector because I think it is very complex. It was very complex for me to learn when I first started out. Persons with Developmental Disabilities is a department of a very large ministry. What it supports are people with developmental disabilities right across Alberta and it provides supports, staff supports for them to live in the community and for them to work in the community. AISH, is a whole separate issue. It's a shared income for the severely handicapped and it provides income to people who are unable to work and it allows them to also live in the community. So I think there are many times that people get those things confused. So housing is very much a separate issue in many ways from supports for people with disabilities. I've said this a number of times in this house that you know we use the word inclusion a great deal. And I want to remind you that inclusion is a verb. It's not a buzzword, and um, I think that we have to be careful when we use it because we have to back it up. There are approximately 10,000 people in Alberta that are supported by PDD. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of people who work in this sector. So I'm pretty sure in every single constituency right across this province, there are people with disabilities and there are people that work in this sector. In 2009, a woman with Down syndrome died in a flashover flame fire. At the time of the fire, she was in a basement and she tragically died of smoke inhalation. A couple of other very tragic incidents uh, involved some scalding deaths. As a result, you may have heard, um, there were some safety standards that were drafted by the bureaucracy of PDE at that time. There were eight, actually. They focused on safety inside and out of the home, furnishings, environmental requirements, medication administration, water temperature, and compliance with the Safety Code Act, zoning, and inspection by public health. There were some strange exceptions to those regulations, but I won't get into that. What that was, was an example of absolutely well-meaning regulations and work done by a group of people that were absolutely well-meaning, but they missed the mark. And they missed the mark because they did not consult the people. They didn't consult the people whose lives were affected by these changes. As a result, and I'm sure you've heard recently, there was a lot of confusion, there was a lot of anger, and there was a lot of talk about these uh, regulations really missing the point and really, in a way, bubble wrapping people with disabilities to the extent that it removed choice. If we didn't already know this, I'm certain we've learned in the last 12 months, for sure since May 5th, that active engagement by families and communities are at the heart of social and cultural reform. For people with disabilities, their families, their friends, unpaid supports, know that community living is essential. The alternative is segregation and congregation, and we all know those ugly stories. We know the ugly legacy of eugenics, forced sterilization, and I was so thrilled to see us all stand in the house out of respect to Leilani Muir O'Malley, who died just a few weeks ago. This woman was a fierce advocate. She was sterilized for failing an IQ test, and she successfully sued the province of Alberta in 1995. So the reason I was telling you a little bit about the PDD safety standards and the, and the services that we offer, we as a government offer, was that what was incredibly meaningful for me, and I, I never would have believed this over a year ago, is that we actually had the ability to go back and to consult where a consultation should have happened. So I'm thankful to the Minister of Human Services that chose to strike a committee to look at these regulations. This was a very, very different consultation than what we were used to. And uh, during my time in the sector, I can't even count the consultations that I've been to, and I don't really know why sometimes they were called consultations. They're more of a lecture. 
But these consultations were about sitting down and having conversations with people. And I think the first few were a bit odd. People walked in the room and, and didn't really know what to do. And so, where do I go? Who's speaking? When does it start? And we had to let them know, no, we're just here to listen. So just sit down. We have some very general questions for you. Tell us what's working. Tell us what, you like, what you'd like to see and what are your ideas. And so, again, it was very unusual to do a consultation like that, but it was so incredibly meaningful. I think we received over 1,200 online submissions, and I think we met with about 750 people across Alberta. We stopped in Westlock, Grand Prairie, Edmonton, of course, Calgary, Red Deer, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, and Fort McMurray. I understand people are busy. I get that. But I was really disappointed that there, were, there wasn't even one MLA um, from any of the opposition show up at these consultations. One of the biggest questions that we ask people at those consultations is what is safety? What makes your home safe and what makes you safe? What we heard again and again and again is that what makes people safe is a real home and a real community. No different than, than ours, no different than people without disabilities. What makes people safe is a decent income, a job, access to qualified and consistent staff. Certainly every Albertan deserves to live in the safest environment possible, but we can't legislate all aspects of people's lives. What we heard, what we heard very loud and clear was more than anything, people with disabilities, their families, their friends, wanted to, their biggest fear was of creating a home that looked like an institution. What keeps people safe is learning from tragedies and creating inclusive poli policies that don't create more complex barriers. So our next steps are phase two. And so you heard, um, last week that the, the PDD safety standards were repealed and I am so incredibly I am so incredibly thankful I the many many people that I know um, in St. Albert people with disabilities their families are overjoyed and I don't think any of us ever imagined that this would happen so these are very complex issues um, I hope that my time here has uh, created a little better understanding and I hope that you'll remember at least some of what I've said when you face difficult choices that shape policy for people with disabilities, their families and their friends. I hope that you're all better equipped to make informed decisions. Thank you.